Senate did indeed confirm Mike Pompeo as director of the CIA today. Vice President Mike Pence, again, swore him in moments ago. The Senate also poised to confirm Rex Tillerson as Secretary of State. This would hand President Trump two victories in his battle to confirm his entire cabinet. Well, Robert Gates has served as both CIA director and Secretary of Defense. He strongly supported Tillerson's nomination when the hearings first began. He's got a book now in paperback. It's called A Passion for Leadership. Last fall, Gates described Donald Trump as, quote, unqualified and unfit to be commander in chief, a man whose weaknesses are, quote, beyond repair. The question is, does he still think that or has he reassessed? We spoke with Secretary Gates a short time ago. Mr. Secretary, thanks a lot for joining us. I appreciate it. Tucker, my pleasure. So in your book, you argue that good leadership can transform bureaucracy. Do you think the Trump administration has the qualities of good leadership necessary to do that to the federal government? Well, certainly the people that I know best uh, have that capability, and that would include um, uh, Rex Tillerson at State, uh, Jim yeah. Mattis at Defense, uh, John Kelly. Uh, at uh, at Homeland Security. I, I don't know uh, Mike Pompeo at CIA as well as I know the others, but I've talked with him several times and I think all four of those people uh, can be transformative. So General Mattis' task seems particularly large just because the Pentagon is so big and so famously complex. If, if you were running the Pentagon once again, what would be your top priority internally? What would, what, what would you want to do first? Well, I think the most important thing is to, bring, is to bring some predictability in terms of the budget. You really can't do anything in terms of reorganization or structuring or making choices on big um, programs without having some uh, idea of how much money you're going to have to spend. So I hope that one of the top priorities of the administration will be to get rid of sequestration and then provide some level of stability to the defense budget. And that means getting away from from these continuing resolutions that have been right. going on for years. And just have Congress do what it's supposed to do. You also ran CA, of course. There has been in the last couple of months, I think, a, a belief among a lot of people that the CIA is more political maybe than most of us assumed it was. And the outgoing director's remarks attacking Trump on his first day in office, saying he ought to be ashamed of himself, wherever you are on the merits of that point, is that helpful? Does that, doesn't that give people the impression that CIA is basically a political place? No, I actually don't think it's helpful. Uh, I think it's very important uh, to have a good relationship uh, and a relationship of trust between the president and and the folks at CIA. They work for him, not vice versa. Right. And I think I think it's up to them uh, to show him the value they can bring to his decision-making process. And I'm I'm pretty confident, based on uh, the conversations that I've had with Mr. Pompeo. Uh, that he knows how to fix that relationship, and, and it's, an, it's, an, it's a great asset for the president, um, and they just need to figure out this relationship. But it's basically uh, the agency figuring out how best to uh, support the president. Every president has a different approach on how he wants to get intelligence information, and, and it's up to the agency to adjust to the president's needs and, and desires, not the other way around. So t Trump and those in his orbit have been saying for months that people at CIA were leaking against them on this question of Russian involvement in the elections. Given how clearly personal the animus is from Brennan toward Trump, I mean, it seems plausible that they were leaking against him. That's, from an outsider's perspective, it, that's the way it strikes me. Do you feel that way? Well, I honestly don't know, Tucker. I, I would be, uh, you know, the rank and file don't do these things, uh, uh, whether right. somebody else was. I just don't know. Huh. Do you, do you think, oh, I, I sure would too, do you think that Russian involvement in this election influenced its outcome in a meaningful way? Uh, I think that the key phrase there was in a meaningful way, and you know I don't have any inside information or access to classified information based on everything I've read. They clearly tried to uh, influence the election, I think in part by just trying to delegitimize American elections in general, not one candidate right. or another, and uh, to say, you know, the American elections are corrupt and they, they, they're, they're no better than ours, so that uh, it's sort of payback for their view of what they think we interfered in other elections, their election in 2012, and so on. But I think that uh, I, I think that it, it's a, essentially uh, I'd be amazed if there were evidence that uh, that it really had an impact on the outcome of the election. Yeah, well, we haven't seen that evidence for sure. Now, one, one of the issues that kind of came out of nowhere for a lot of people, but has been front and center of the debate, 
on the foreign policy side, is moving the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, the Obama administration has suggested, rather the Trump administration has suggested it will do that. Is that in America's interest to do that? This is one of those issues that I hope the administration will think about carefully and they may decide ultimately to make that change, but as they contemplate having to deal with Iran, as they contemplate the situation in Syria, as we're still fighting against ISIS in both Syria and Iraq, I think they also need to take into account, so what is the impact of moving the embassy in terms of our potential allies uh, or people working with us in the Middle East to try and deal with ISIS? So these things get tied together. Maybe they'll decide at the end of the day to move it, but, the, but there are clearly linkages among the these things and it needs to be a carefully considered decision and with the advice of the of the president's senior advisors who is the best defense secretary since the second world war who, who do you admire <laughs> uh, uh, other than you <laughs> I, I think that um, Harold Brown was a very good defense secretary in the Carter administration. I think uh, yeah. Mel Laird was perhaps one of the most effective uh, secretaries. Even during a period of great budget drawdowns, uh, Laird saw to it that we began uh, putting seed money into things like stealth and others that then were later developed by Harold Brown and, and, uh, and his successors. So I think both of them were, were a very effective secretary of defense and they knew how to operate inside the building but they also were very effective in dealing with the Congress. Right. Interesting. They don't get much credit. Thanks. Thank you Mr. Secretary and thanks for your book. Really smart. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Thank you.